bad. I just started recording with OBS. Um, still trying to figure out all the audio issues, but I, I think it's been okay. It works better than Vogel okay. screen, so. All right. Thank you. I'm going to just record it just in case uh, myself. So, yeah. Okay. So, team meeting agenda, March 19th. Um, okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Tuesday, March 19th, meeting of the OSC development team. So today, what I have on my plate here is more updates on so a few exciting things happening right now. So for example, the manufacturing execution systems work uh, towards the what we may call the open source everything store, uh, OSCS, open source everything store. I want to see if you can maybe start talking about that a little bit, but um, also good update uh, on the incentive challenge work. Uh, regarding real solid conceptualization on that and then updates on D3D. Um, let's see. So I'll, I'll start it. And, and this week, let's have the next session of the open source golf cart design sprint. We've got a lot of uh, the design in for that. And one, one last thing is, uh, Abe, the, the clamp part, that's actually working. I'll get back to that, uh, but that's on my personal Facebook page if you want to pull that up, uh, if you want to copy and paste that from my own uh, Facebook where I posted this. So so first thing is, let's talk about the manufacturing execution systems. So we've heard uh, John bring this topic up and he's working on this. So he, he's uh, intending to have a, a demo facility of this facility or demo minimum working product of this uh, pretty soon in the next, I guess, in the next week or so, uh, basically implementing the idea that you can order parts th that are 3D printed online, automatic processing of payment, and therefore um, also connected to a physical production plant of a 3D printer that can knock off parts and, and uh, print parts and then knock them off the build plate so that we can set up somewhat of an automated production system for hardware. Now, the, the good part about it is, of course, as always, a fully open source tool chain. So I recommend, do take a look at that video. Uh, that's actually just posted that from Friday. Um, let me see, uh, let me go to the YouTube. Oh yeah, you can just click on it. Uh, but yeah, very very much worth listening to, to get the concept and what's possible today, because right now it's it's somewhat, somewhat of low hanging fruit to, take existing open source software, open source 3D printers, and internet infrastructures that make this pretty much feasible right now today with, and, and then with a little bit of work with the open source tool chain. So not sure what, um, haven't looked too much into who is doing open source work on this, haven't studied the industry standards, but I haven't seen this anywhere, to, of course, as far as who has something that's fully open source where you can replicate a manufacturing system where you connect 3D printers and ordering online and so forth, the whole whole kind of a tool chain for that. And I'm sure there's pieces of that and various people have done it, but where can we find something that we can really build upon and maybe invite those people as collaborators? So that, that is really good. Now uh, that ties into the, the work of the 3D printers. So this is basically the latest build here. This is what I'm building right now. Still haven't run it. I was doing a lot of troubleshooting of this, uh, kind of like there's a lot of minor changes here, so I'll go through that. But the current version, D3 V1902, as you see here, now is able to access the full 8 by 8 inch reach of the bed. Uh, and I think it's about going to be about 7 inches in a Z direction, but it's, it's such that the axis rides on top and you're able to reach all the, all the space. Now, this is with a 12 inch frame. Okay? This is a tiny frame. Now, 12 inches takes care of some of the shipping issues. Like, for example, I mentioned a USPS uh, flat rate shipping box. 
that will take care of it. Large one. It's 12 by 12 inches, and this printer is actually just slightly under 12, like 11 7 eighths um, for the outer one, for the, the outer frame reaches. So say we're shipping this. Okay, so working on some production engineering issues with that. Um, one thing I found out was that uh, I mentioned the through hole in one of the carriages for wiring, uh, for sending the wiring all the way through. Uh, that happened not to work. I had to reroute the wiring because simply they were the wires that were gonna were interfering with the frame at the end of the motion. So no good. End stops. The end stops are great. It's the smaller version of end stops um, that you can see. Uh, the source for this is D three D V nineteen o two. Let me actually share. Share my screen. Uh, share D3D V1902 page. So you see this. This is the actual extruder that's used with the sensor holder fan blower. Um, new end stops look like what you have here in these. So, so a tiny, very tiny structure that holds a tiny end stop and it mounts right on the rods. That's working well. Um, the new sensor fan holder I mentioned. Now the nozzle, I also, over the CAD, so the CAD is fully drawn up. Now the CAD, let me see, I'm going to open up the CAD right here. Um, do we have one here? I'm not sure if I have the CAD on my desktop here. I'm going to just download it. I'll show you one detail about uh, it's 589 um, K right now. I'll show you a couple of features. So one thing I had to do here was raise the, in a, in a real build. As you may see in this picture here, I'll zoom into that. This thing is riding over the frame completely. So we have a Titan Aero nozzle, so the big, big Titan heater block. But it's riding above the surface of the frame. And why? Because if I, I want to make sure that when people are using this and they're starting up, um, that there's never a case where the nozzle could actually hit the frame, which wasn't an, like if you look at the CAD right now, what's the CAD show? Well. The CAD shows that the nozzle, let me just do a view orthographic. So look at this. See the nozzle is like right at the top of the, the frame. In reality, it happened to be like maybe a little lower because this CAD may be slightly inaccurate. But what I had to do is uh, raise, I, I had to redrill the holes in the frame to raise this so the nozzle does not very conclusively ever hit the frame because you can break the nozzle. Uh, break the heater block off the entire structure if you ram into it. Um, ram into the frame with the stepper motors. So yeah, just raise that up to be completely safe. Um, this is pretty much how how the thing looks uh, for the for the bed. You see these sandwiches of of idler pieces that are raising it. All I did here was actually I didn't do the. This was my initial idea that it turned out what I did was use a motor piece standing vertically. So instead of using three more pieces, I used one motor piece standing vertically, caught through the nut catcher holes in a motor. So you know how the X you can have X to Y connections using the universal access system, like for example where you connect the bed here to the carriage. Uh, through, using these nut catch, uh, through holes, nut catchers inside the, some of the printed pieces. But that's how I attach the uh, motor piece to make a vertical platform stand. Why? Because the bed has to be a little higher because the, the nozzle is so high. The, the printing gantry is so high. So why all this mess about using these standard parts? Well, one of the design principles here is absolute minimum part count. So that's by design, so that we're not adding any more additional parts here. It also uh, had a slight discovery too that, uh, which was kind of accidental, but we know that this system is designed for using just two bolts to put the entire 
Ganj uh, universal axis together, 18 millimeters and 30 millimeter M6 bolts, two bolts. Once again, minimum part count. Turns out the M18 bolt, and this is a very fine detail, the M18 bolt is actually sufficient if you use in this piece right here. If instead of uh, using, this is a clamshell of two pieces, which is not drawn in detail here, but it's a clamshell of two pieces. If you use the M18 bolt, you can also do that. So standard, you use the M30 bolt to go through this uh, piece if you want to use the nut hatch catcher hull of a piece that's lying perpendicular to it. Turns out that with the M18 bolt, you can use one half piece um, and use the bottom piece and, and go straight to a piece with a nut catcher like the, the motor piece. So uh, coincidentally or incidentally or accidentally, the M18 is actually able to catch a half uh, sandwich to another nut catcher in another perpendicular part. Uh, that may be just all gibberish to you, but if you work with this system, you'll see that that's actually a cool artifact because it allows you to do a different way to connect two things at right angles using no, no additional parts. Okay, that's... Um, that's a discovery, which was kind of interesting uh, from my perspective, since we're like, we're saying we've got just a few tiny, tiny set of pieces. What is it like? Uh, what was that number like 12 or something? Some small number that gets you the entire universal access system. It's only like somewhere in a tens area, which I don't think anybody else does. So for the entire universal access, um, good stuff. On that, so moving forward, and yeah, this thing is looking pretty sweet. I am expecting, now I didn't print, print anything yet, but I'm expecting absolute top quality prints. Um, what you see here, so let me just give you this detail here, but this is this, um, this piece here that I'm pointing to. So let me zoom into that, because that's the point of the automatic alignment of the two Y axes. So part of the trick here to make this run smoothly with loose axes is to make sure that you never have the x-axis bind up between the two y-axes. Um, I'm going to zoom in. It's not allowing me to zoom in for some reason. Let's zoom in this way. This piece here is the half carriage piece. It's got the bearing inside. So if the, this is one of the Y axes here. If the y, y1 and Y2 are not exactly parallel, this has a little play where this can go in and out of the, this, this idler piece, which has bearings inside of it. So, so the actual motion is carried, the idler piece, this is the functional idler piece. And then this one is the alignment piece where these rods can go in and out if the Y axes are not parallel. And that looks like that's great. That means we'll never, ever get binding up, and you don't have to even pay attention to how parallel your y-axes are, whereas before we had to be very careful that they're quite parallel, otherwise your axes would bind up. So it's a good good step forward in terms of ease of producing this thing on your own. Uh, once again, going for industrial productivity in a small scale, meaning distributed production, distributed enterprise, where anybody can do this without particularly requiring very high skill sets to make this work well and work at, I mean, how well? Professional grade, the perfect prints uh, made by amateurs. Yeah. Um, so let me continue on to the incentive challenge. Um, so incentive challenge uh, I can send you guys, and you can actually remind me afterwards. I can't share this in the public because my coach, I have a coach for marketing, and he's not. Uh, we think we're going to do some major, major annihilation of <laughs> transformation of uh, various sectors, so he didn't want to publish this for threat of, of success. But uh, uh, the idea is I can send you the, the conversation. It was an hour-long conversation, but we, we really made some progress on the design challenge, Part of the, the stuff where we're talking about the cordless drill being a, an online challenge and putting a lot of effort to it. So actually raising the bar quite a bit, getting 
so if we do it on a cordless drill, we would involve Home Depot, Lowe's, and Menards. We, we'd involve those people for distribution. But basically, the idea being uh, put a lot of energy into it, uh, enlist the developers not only for the design challenge, but with a very explicit intent of of them having this as a sideline business opportunity. So, so create enough of that infrastructure to make it happen. So that means some of the business development sides would have to go into the development challenge. So um, what's new about this? Nothing much outside of what was the news to me was that a person, namely my coach, uh, totally got onto the idea of this, this concept of a distributive enterprise where we're going mainstream and actually scaling completely through mom and pop operations, distributed production, all the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, so meaning fully open source, fully open source tool chain for production, uh, fully open source design, and with the intent that we're actually would, would be able to succeed in a given marketplace like a cordless drill, which is a $10 billion global market. Now, um, the idea here is, and, and I, I wrote about this a little bit since this is a hot topic for me. If you look at uh, the link on this page, uh, so fit this thing. Uh, look at the open source product development and incentive challenges. Let, let's go to that. I wrote about this, the concepts. You can please study this. This is getting good. Uh, so under open source product development, we have different ways how we go about it. So talking about how we involve schools, how we can involve people in the general process in OSC, and then the incentive challenges part. So if you go to the incentive challenges, there's a bunch of notes on the mechanics of that. Uh, um, so I guess the main highlights that I'd like to summarize are that we involve the developers in a deep way. They're true stakeholders. Uh, there's nothing new here really like compared to what we've been talking about in terms of concepts, but the, the, the bottom line ends up with execution, right? So. So it's about, can we build the relationships? Can we do the marketing properly to make this happen? And can we get the resources to make this happen? Because right now we're talking about, uh, I mentioned to my coach, okay, 100K, then you get as the incentive prize. That's, that sounds like a lot of money. Uh, we think it'll actually take more than that because we need some more infrastructure to, to make that happen, to make sure that the marketing happens, the community building happens. Um, and then the question is, how do you fundraise that? Well, cr once again, crowdsourcing. Uh, so we have to have a compelling case and, and some credibility behind this. Uh, but that's that's the state. The, the idea was that my coach was able to understand that and completely see the potential in that to the point that he was suggesting that, yeah, we can make a significant and scalable dent on this, at least to the point that there was no struggle whether this is possible. It's definitely possible. And the question now, now comes down to, okay, how do you actually end up doing this? Uh, whereas before I was running and like, you know, when I talked about this to different people, it's like, uh, yeah, a uh, nice idea. <laughs> but how are you going to do that? This, this is more like, okay, this is good. We can make it work. How do we make it work? Right. So that was very encouraging. And this is the, the beginning of that. Uh, and that completely goes into the work with a 3D printer, because if you talk about a small enterprise for that, you can also incorporate life cycle stewardship. That means you're uh, getting your raw materials from the recycled stream or you're recycling the products at the end of life, so like a cordless drill. Uh, one of the main value propositions here is that the cordless drill may not necessarily be cheaper up front as far as the time or, or money it takes you to build it. It'll be like, you know, 50 to 100 bucks, like a regular drill, but the difference is going to be on the lifetime. Here, if you can replace it, repair it, you're talking about not maybe like, say, two to five years or two to seven years that, uh, that professional cordless drills last. You're talking for as long as you like. So let's say 10x the efficiency on material use because you can always recycle or rebuild it 
uh, upgrade it as you like. Um, let's see, what does a quick search uh, for average life of a professional for this drill? For us, for OSC case, we know that the answer is as long as you like. Um, cordless drill, life expectancy of a cordless drill. Let's see what they say. For brands like DeWalt or others. Let's see. Um, active ones, like, for example, here. $2,000. And do you have anything? Any insight on that? Margin, you, you cut out just a little bit, or I read right at that last bit. Yeah, oh, okay, that's because I'm, I'm searching online here. I, I'm asking, what is the average life of a cordless drill. Yeah. Here's, he says, I am expecting to rebuy everything in 10 years. He's asking a question. Um, I've heard somewhere it was like two to seven years, uh, given like real professional use. And I know that the answer for factory farm is more like six months. Uh, because whenever we have workshops, people drop the drills, and you know, damage is very common. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's why I started thinking about that in the first place. Because we were just like buying like ten drills every year or something, which was I thought it was ridiculous. Um, so for us, it's, we're definitely a good use case of of a place where re repairability is a is a great feature um, um but it but it's like that for anything anyone else i mean um think about upgrading or modifying for as long as you like and so forth so that's the that's the idea so that covers the uh the incentive challenge part so that's getting ready for that don't know, don't have a date for when it will kick off but um that's definitely major motion forward so let's talk about collaborative product development. So with all this burbling up with John's um, manufacturing execution system, all this open source work that Katarina and I are talking about, she's she's into uh, <clears throat> cosmetics like like such as well she, back back from her materials work. Uh, she's doing, for example, things like deodorant soaps, uh, shower gels. She's actually experimenting a little bit with that right now. But uh, there's products like, for example, 3D printed uh, underarm protection or deodorant uh, container and all this stuff combines 3D printing and you've got some products on top of that. So that's one realm. Another realm is all kinds of mechatronics. Another realm is furniture, everything, you, know, you name it. Um, I mean, my claim is 80% of what's on Amazon if you have open source design and basic microfactory. But... Um, so so the thing i would call out for is uh getting more attention to so you can take a look at the page called open source everything store basically a distributed enterprise where the question is how do you motivate people to to collaborate on doing that like how do you develop products openly well first of all you have to be radically open and, and accept that um the kind of bravery that says hey we're actually giving this away to the world but the idea would be that uh, people create this collaboratively. So this is a little template I drew up, but you can buy the product or you can buy pr the production of that product. What is that? That means you can get trained how to manufacture that too. Not only can you consume it, but you can also produce it. So once again, transitioning uh, the framework of society from consumers to more producers everywhere uh, along the concept of distributed market substitution. Like there's huge products out there like, Unilean soap or whatever, you know, common products that uh, can definitely be done in a distributive way and therefore this and substituting the great global so-called evil corporation um, 
because the way it works, I think a lot of times is when things get large, they tend to get unaccountable. So distributed enterprise is a good idea, but there's a huge environmental bent to that in that um, the current way I frame that is if you want to be an environmentalist, you should produce in your own community. And why? Because I believe that the only way we're going to get accountability for the natural materials, natural resources, is if they're, they come closer from, from our communities, because then we see the effects we have on the environment. It's not somewhere far away where you don't see, but it's part of your life. So you have to take include or not externalize the environment is just part of the way things are. So that's why I think the case for distributed and local production, uh, in my view, is in inevitable because we cannot continue going as we are today with a lot of the uh, global annihilation through environmental, various environmental issues. So that's, that's the greater motivation here. Uh, but on the open source everything store, the question is, uh, I don't know if, if you want to, during this meeting, maybe brainstorm a few ideas about the governance, because it really, uh, when we talk about the collaboration specification, how do we, how do we collaborate to do that? Uh, so first of all, we can start talking about that in our group here, then invite other people, but first get very clear about, okay, how is this going to work? And uh, I would propose that in order to involve any people, it has to be simple, low hanging, kind of an enterprise. Uh, the way we can do it using modern distributed computer infrastructure is by embedding things. So, so there's all kinds of software tools for, for marketing or like your website to put your product on, your credit card processing or this or that, um, that can be treated as modules. And, and I would propose that if we start this in a massive way, the way it can scale is using very simple platforms. If you don't do anything dedicated, like um, if you don't want a dedicated platform, just start experimenting on a wiki, which is an infinitely, infinitely scalable platform. You can embed everything in there. So we can do mock-ups or prototypes on the wiki. And then different people can uh, set up by using the different modules, set up their own store. So it doesn't even have to be micromanaged. It could be a very wild thing. Now, of course, it has to some underlying uh, organization, some framework for it, but the least interference on the bureaucracy side, the, the better. Once again, that requires a very careful design of how you plan it all out or how, you know, how you would do that to make it work and to motivate people to actually contribute to this uh, rather than contributing to, like right now, people might get hired, they, some company hires them. How would you get people to, to work in a public domain, in a public setting, where they're not hired by a company, but still the benefits are like that, that there's an infrastructure for how uh, you can actually generate revenue from that and actually spreads in the marketplace. So, so that question is not easy and nobody has answered that to date on this planet. And I think um, we can push some answers with the OSC design challenge on the cordless drill. That could be a great example of how we can perhaps push that forward to motivate a lot of people to collaborate. Um, but, you know, the potential of open source hardware has not in any way been achieved yet. So that's an outstanding. So, I mean, uh, with this open source everything, are you thinking like kind of a mixture between Craigslist and Amazon, but for open yeah. source, so yeah. you can start your own store? Yeah. So okay. the way, why I, why I call it open source everything store, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon calls itself the open, the, it's not the open source, but it, it calls itself the everything store, right? Yeah. So we have to break that. We have to break that into the open source everything store mm -hmm. because the Facebooks and Amazons, if left unchecked, I think are quite dangerous for society, as some would say, for example, in 2016 election with Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so we have to distribute this kind of stuff, make it accessible. And this is the idea and how you execute it is the, is the golden question. But yeah, it's, it's that, that uh, not only can you put your products up there, and I mean, the way it could work is that the resources there are truly free. Knowledge wants to be free, but we're, we're transitioning. The knowledge wants to be free into economics wants to be free, like really free enterprise, no monopolies. Just let's let's actually liberate economics, too. So that's I, the promise. That have you have you thought about um, like. I guess tying these two ideas together, you know, that you want to incentivize people to 
develop um, and you have a store. And so like, have you thought about uh, some sort of like crypto, like OSC cryptocurrency that you yeah. can as developers with and they can spend money kind of in that environment? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, plenty of times, but my opinion on that is uh, there's a certain order to that. Like, mm-hmm. of course you can mix that a little bit, but, but the, but the physical reality has to precede the cryptocurrency. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. For, for, sure. Since, for sure. Right, right. Everyone today insists that first we're going to create the cryptocurrency and then we're going to create physical realities that support it. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the wrong way to think about it. And I, I mean, Bitcoin falls into that. Everyone falls into this trap as far as I'm concerned. It's like, what is the phys- like? I believe that. Uh, currency should be backed, that, and the most tangible way to back it is, is by physical stuff. So, so if you have the open source everything store, or or like the open source micro factory, you've got a global repository of of design that is super high quality, like professional grade goods for everything that the yeah. industry actually draws from. With mm-hmm. that, start talking about new monetary systems and bypassing of the Fed. You know, yeah. right now we can't because we don't have an alternate reality. So yeah, that's well, I think oh. the, the, the idea of the, our own currencies, I mean, that's just part of the institutions that we have to transform, right? And that, that probably will happen pretty soon. But yeah, there's a, there's an order to that, the sequencing to how that should happen. Definitely on my radar, but, you know, like, can't really get too excited about these things when, when they're not starting with, okay, how do we create the physical realities? Like, the, the proper way to do it is like, okay, let's think about a cryptocurrency, but what is that thing that... Uh, is driving the economy that's underneath that. Yeah, you most definitely. <laughs> and, you know, the name is suggestive, like Ethereum. It's Ether, right? Um, <laughs> so so we've got an issue there that we got to address. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, lots of very cool stuff. But the conversation with John just was actually quite encouraging because uh, – I guess he was like the first person to really say, okay, bam, let's do it. And really, really co- connecting to these ideas and actually potentially has the skills to actually do that with his engineering background. So that's really good. We just need more of that. We need more people like John to, with the skill sets to just simply get involved in working on the pieces. But the first thing that, of course, you have to have the open, open culture or that collaborative literacy that makes you do that in the first place. Cause without that, uh, this right. is like, like completely foreign and impossible in one's mind, right? Like if you talk yeah, to some a century ago, they be like you're crazy, and most people think like you're crazy to try to do this distributed stuff. <laughs> Even my dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, of course, of course. Our parents are not there, um, right? My parents still ask me when I'm going to get a job, right? So <laughs> stuff like that. That's that's the reality. Um, yeah, so, uh, but very exciting stuff that's happening in this. And I think we can really do a lot to push it forward. And it's not as super distant as it seems it's, it's around the corner. I think with, um, if we really were to pay attention to the promise of open source, like for example, look at Ruslan, for example, I mean, he's working on logistics systems that are funded by the likes of Amazon, right? Well, it takes a few people like Ruslan and, you know, there's John, there's ourselves, everybody put in the missing pieces of a, of a framework that is open source, not just benefiting some one funder, some one company that funds it. Uh, just like there's a lot of issues today with academia being corporate funded, where a lot of that knowledge you never, ever see. You know, it's public institutions and all that stuff hides because comp- companies uh, either playing don't publish or they publish stuff that's that's secure for them to publish because nobody will compete with them because they don't disclose the full information on how to do things. Right. So there's definite issues with academia. That's that's where the open science movement comes in, where people are saying, OK, everybody, first of all, should have access to the papers. Like right now, that's in our way. I cannot get access to a lot of papers that have cutting edge stuff that could be relevant to our work, right? That's yeah. that's a definite need that we need to address as we go forward as a society um, to liberate knowledge. Okay, so there's those awesome things happening in the background. So let's hear more about uh, other topics. So John is working in the background. 
Um, yeah, maybe uh, Nathan will discuss with you. So actually, I'm printing the part right now. Let me okay. actually check where it is. But the thing that occurred to me, it's like, okay, um, for one, I printed the thing out for A that works, but you guys all, we, we got to get our hands on a printers. And I think the framework to to work with that with is, okay, let's think about a $250 printer. Do you guys have 250 bucks to spend on one? Because you yeah. can build one for that. Um, and therefore... What I would suggest is actually so Abe, Abe, and Nathan, take a look at where. Let's take a look at where the D3D PVC is, because I think you can get. I don't see why you cannot get very good performance with a PVC frame. Now you might not get as as good as what we do with metal, and you might not be able to go as fast. But for mm -hmm. basic prototyping purposes, I think you should be perfectly fine. And you can go to a lower brow extruder like. The, okay, so the get a lot of this. The Titan Arrow, as I mentioned, I mean that's a hundred bucks, and if you get the big, big nozzle, the it's called the Super Volcano. That's another hundred bucks. So it's, there's like two hundred, actually close to three hundred, um, in the extruder itself. If you go full professional grade, like mm -hmm. high throughput, but you can get a twenty dollar extruder as well, which would be you know that's what we used initially. So there's different ways to do it. And for the, what I would say is for the PVC, let's finalize the design and maybe I could test print it and see if it's an actual real working product. Uh, at, so at least the corners, maybe like the PVC will let you guys, you know, get that in a hardware store, but the corners and everything as much as we can, we can 3D print that, including the attachments to the frame, which, um, I don't see that in today's meeting, so I'm going to go um, to my Facebook because the update on that, on the clamp, which clamps to the PVC, three-quarter inch PVC that Abe drew up, it's working actually. So so what happened was, uh, so I, I tested it with with uh, three-quarter inch PVC as here, and um, so my Facebook, let me just paste it in, copy image and paste it in. Cool. Um, the thing is, it turned out that what I was using was a table that I thought it was three-quarter PVC, but actually wasn't. So, so when I tested it with what I know is definitely three-quarter inch PVC, because it's the white stuff, uh, that actually works well. And, and what I'm showing there is the one millimeter gap version. And the tight, the, the hold was pretty tight. Uh, you can spin that, like. If you if you take it, you can sit in the PVC, but it's really hard to push it down. You can't push it down with its basic clamping force. Uh, and that's printed just 20%. So if you printed it more solid, it would probably get even more stiff. But I think 20% is fine enough. Uh, so, Abe, let's see. Let's maybe um, – how would you feel about kind of focusing a little more on a PVC version as in, like, let's get ready for a build of that? That's what I've been looking at. Um, let's see, I posted a bunch of photos. Actually, I was just looking at your, your photos a lot there because they answered a lot of questions I was still having about um, the CAD because the CAD, I think, was a little bit rougher. And then you, I see your, your mock-up there. Um, yeah. But I, I was just kind of looking in rough uh, on my CAD. I think I that updated. I just kind of threw that overhead concept in there. Uh, to see uh -huh. how, how that would work out on the PVC. So it's taking measurements and seeing where it might, uh, I just keep looking at, at different points where things might hit or adaptations to the parts maybe a little. And I was kind of seeing that it looks like, I mean, that, that metal frame is, is one inch wide. And so I figured that the three quarter inch PVC should be a little bit smaller actually. Although uh, uh, I think it's actually... Uh, I think the total diameter on that is a little bit larger, actually, because it's point, um, is it point five. I'm trying to remember it. I think it's uh, a pretty significant diameter on that side of the PVC, but it, it shouldn't be that hard to adapt. I think uh, so far, assuming can get, uh, like you were talking about the extruder hitting the top of that metal there. I was looking at that earlier. I didn't realize how the motor was kind of mounted up above and all that, so... Mm -hmm. That requires some obviously changes. Although I see, 
more what you yeah. said about the bed being raised up. Um, yeah. I wasn't expecting to make that many changes on this, but I guess, you know, it's nice to keep them consistent between printers, if that, that's a better way to do it for yeah. pretty much all of the frames, designs in general, that, that's going to make this volume, it'd be good to keep it consistent. So the thing right. I see immediately is the angle brackets. Uh, they have to be a little bit, um, I'll say, taller. Uh, I think they have to come down at least a, a quarter inch longer. Uh, you called them the, uh, the XY angle brackets, I think. Yeah. Adapt that overhead X. I think those have to be I'd have to, at least a quarter inch uh, longer to mount to the the frame on the for, with the PVC. Mainly because those clamps they're not designed to go up on the corners. They just right. go right below the corners, and so that actually sets it down a little bit lower. That's the issue there. I mean, I guess the clamps could be. I don't know if it would be re that easy to redesign the clamps to go on the corner part. That, that'd be a lot more oh, wow. trouble. I'm not sure that that would um, work very well. Plus, we might end up needing huh. uh, multiple designs of the clamps, like a clamp version that goes on the, the pipe part, and then on the corner it would be different. So, um, yeah, I just put the excess in there, yeah. and I'm just trying to eyeball what what would work and what would not uh it's well not, i well i actually i raised it up i think an eighth an inch and i just i'm, I'm, I'm just looking at it so i think in that in there i think that the uh carriage currently is just skimming the top of the pipes um or well it's even with the top of the pipe i think and so i think i think it needs to come up a little higher just to avoid some things hitting but uh huh. Uh, the only thing I see right now, I'm sure there's a bunch of other issues, is that X Y angle bracket would need to be a little bit uh, taller in the Z direction, the way it mounts there. Um, right. I, could, I think I get a little better from your photos of the actual uh, mock-up you did. Uh, some of the stuff I wasn't understanding in the CAD, so that's that's good. But uh, I guess is. Issues like you said, yeah, the yeah, hot just, end um, hitting the um, yeah. the hot end potentially hitting, which is, I guess that that's prevented though by the um, well, it should be fairly preventable by the end stops, right? Well, I guess there's one end stop, but well, yeah, yeah, that that is completely preventable. I'm saying when you're in a failure mode, I want don't want to create the chance of breakage. Yes, the end stops will address that, but imagine you're you don't have your end stop. You don't want to lose your a break off your extruder uh, heater block, and then have a pain using a screw extractor trying to you know extract that threaded part that's in there. Uh, so by design, we have to design it so it's impossible uh, under a fault condition for it to break. Uh, but now one easy solution here: all you could do is have one plate that's simply the um uh, it can literally be one of the um you know a half piece of the okay let me actually do that like right now no i can't uh, but if i okay so are you seeing my screen yes Okay, so if you look at my screen, all you need to do is use, for example, this is the carriage piece here. Take one clamshell, one of two. So this is a clamshell made of two pieces. Take one clamshell and use that as a vertical extender. And that'll be your solution. If you don't want to add any other parts. Oh, I think, I think in that CAD, let's see, it looks like the clamp isn't all the way up against the corner. I don't know why. And that's true too. So you're almost like yeah. really reaching. I guess I need to, I need to push an update. Yeah. Actually and then remember, we talked about the corner pieces possibly being inserted into the pipes. Remember, not not the pipes go into the oh. corner piece. The corner piece moves into the pipe. The diameter is not different, and therefore that's, you don't need any additional pieces to make this work. That's true. I didn't. Um, 
I don't, I don't know if I heard that before. So, yeah, we can 3D print a different corner that inserts into the yeah. pipe pieces. Okay. Yes. That would change yes. the diameter of those. They could be kept the same diameter. That that would be interesting because those should be yeah. easier to 3D print. No, that would be really cool. Uh, the cool thing about this is that because the clamps are adjustable vertically, you can get like perfect alignment without having to worry about where the screw holes are because you know, there are no screw holes. Yeah. 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 And the corners that changes that is there initially, of course, it, yeah, it would be nice if the corners snap together. Well, because initially, obviously, it, it, when you're prototyping this stuff, you want to be able to take it apart and rework things and change things. Mm -hmm. Um and of course, eventually I was thinking of trying to fill it with stuff to stiffen things. I'd be interested to try some stuff with that, um, if that affected it. Because yeah, I'm curious to hear how. Hmm, what what this? I think the only thing that's really affected by the the flexibility of the frame is probably the speed. So it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. What the speed is here? How shaky? So, it is. so I've been thinking about that. That my thoughts from before are so so make all these parts hollow, right? So then at the end, like when you're building your frame, you can drill, say, a half inch hole or like a three quarter inch hole in one of the corner pieces and have plaster of Paris that you just pour down with a funnel and it fills the entire frame. You probably would need a little weep hole at the bottom to let the air out. But basically stand the, stand the frame up at a 45 degree angle uh, on one corner and basically pour into the opposite corner on the top. So you have a completely solid frame. Yeah, that's, that's probably ways, um, yeah, we could print the 3D corners so they have a hole. Um, yeah. Uh, we could print other parts and make it so they have holes and then plug the holes with little plugs that we print or something, but that, that yeah. creates a bunch yeah, of you pieces. Yeah, could do that. Because um, um, yeah, you could assemble the whole frame and then pour it afterward if there are air holes yeah. in there. Although, yeah, you, I would pour into each corner or something. That it might yeah, you could, you could do that. That would be easier because um, you're talking about like how liquid that substance that you're going to be pouring in there is and will it yeah. solidify fully. And yeah. Of course, if you could put more aggregate or fill or something in it that you would use less of the the, the plaster of Paris or whatever it is. But um, yeah, yeah, I don't know that that yeah. helps. But Have you yeah. Check this one out. Like, what about like rough sand that's, that's got definite air spaces in it, and then you just pour concrete, like liquid cement paste. Yeah, I They'll think just that they, everything I've, up. I've experienced pumping um, stuff like yeah. They, I know that they actually pump <laughs> they pump uh, different plaster materials with sand mixes in in floors and buildings and so on. So they, there's probably different mixtures you can do that pour pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, no, that would be some cool innovation here. So um, publish it on a wiki so nobody can patent it, and then we're good to go. Yeah, I'm going to keep um, looking at that top because uh, I've got to see what, what uh, changes. I, I don't think that modifying that bracket is it's going to affect anything uh, on the other, so I think I'll just modify that and extend it down. Um, and I'm not sure... Let's see, I, a lot of the holes and stuff I see in your CAD, because I've got that open too, still looking at that. Uh, some of those things there, it looks like they're, they're scale different or, or sizes. Some things don't line up, but I, that's, it's just rough CAD. Yeah, um, I'm not using any assembly. I'm just using by eye aligning things. Yeah, and that journal is pretty good. Um, those, actually, I'm curious. I'm going to have to look at the end stops again. I know it doesn't look like you updated anything recently in there. It looked like the history no. was back to the... No, I've been building the real thing. Um, those end stops you got snapped on there, I guess there's... Yeah. They just snap on one rail. Is that... Yeah, just exactly like this one here. Okay, are they... Hmm. Yep. You've tested those or...? And yeah, yeah, they're, they work well. Works okay. great. Okay, so they don't like move um, around or... No, they're oh, stiff. I, I made that hole from the original file just slightly smaller. The guy had it, the source file had it like eight millimeters. I put it down to like 7.9 or something like that. And, okay. and it's just made tighter. Yeah, I was trying so to now it's pretty stiff. if they move or something over time, it, is it gets bumped. Uh, I, was thinking, I don't know, you, you could make it go. I was thinking it'd probably be 
You could make it go so that it snaps across both rails somehow, but that might require... You can, but the belt's in a way. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what you gotcha. mean from it, but look at it. That's... Here's the real picture. This works great. Hmm. Yeah, okay. okay. So they... And now using two wires, uh, I actually had to reverse. There was a setting in Marlin I had to change. This was... I had to set inverting and stop to like reverse it from true to false or false to true or something because the way it's set up right now, I just had to make this little upgrade in Marlin. Not a big deal. Yeah, so let's see. You were saying uh, for kits for, for starting to prototype or test these, you were saying it was like a, or a couple hundred bucks or something. What kind of kit setup? Yeah. Um, I, I know you did some research on that before. What kind of... Uh, because I guess, like you said, we get PVC pipe from the stores, but what kind of um, kit, uh, do you have a listing of that kind of thing from before? I can't remember. Yeah, uh, yeah, so it's simple, how did you call it? Simple 3D printer bomb. Oh, okay. So take a look at that, and what would be useful is maybe uh, take your design and understand where each of those parts fits. So go through that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's probably some new 3D printed parts that need to be included, right, uh, for changes. Um, I know, I'm not sure I get all the, um, I, I see you've got different, let's see, I can need to look at your photos again. There's there's a bunch of plates that go around the extrude, or there's two plates, I should say, that go around the, the carriage for the extruder mount. It looks like the holes... Oh yeah. They didn't look like they lined up there, so I was trying to figure out what. Um, have you tested? Let's see. Oh, it does look like you have that in. That's the that's well tested. So, take a look at um, the picture. No, the CAD is. It's exactly as it is in the CAD. So that means. Okay. Let's see. What do you see in the CAD? You see the motor bracket, right? Yeah, but okay. But hold on. That's with the tight narrow which I'm not sure you want to go right to the tight and narrow because it's too expensive. Um, so if you do a regular, some other type of a, an extruder, like from before, the thing that does work well is a bracket like this where you're attaching through the faceplate because otherwise what we have done before is that holder where you're just holding the back of the motor, that's fine too. Yeah. But it won't work in this case because now you've got this overslung design. Ah, okay, and here's the other thing. In the overslung design, unfortunately, you'd have to go to underslung because the extruder tip is not going to reach below the below your carriage. Here we're using the volcano heater block, so you'd have to use something with a longer heater block in order for it to reach below the carriage that it's sitting on. You see? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, but differences. besides that, the double plate, like you see there, yeah, it's exactly what I'm on the bottom. That's just a flat so, plate, and it's yeah. On those plates, there's three holes there. They don't yeah. um, seem to line up. Uh, the bolts go through those. Through, they just go around the the outside of the carriage. Is that the idea? It's, they don't. What I was um, they don't line up with um, where there's. Well, that, I guess. With a rod. Well, they line up to each other. They yeah. they span okay. on the outside of the carriage, but they go right through each other, right? Yeah, as long as they miss the, the rod there. and They do. They get, it's close. Uh, so let me show you. See it. Look at it. That's the top view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see a slight little interference. It's a slightly off, but it works. It's uh, it's just like that. The, the carriage is just touches the, the three millimeter bolts that go in there. So using three millimeter bolts plus nylon lock washers that make it firm and the washer is not going to come off. So tiny three millimeter lock washer, which in production engineering terms, I do not like three millimeter bolts or nuts or whatever. They're tiny. You can hardly get them in your hand, right? So you need to use, um, use like pliers and hold the... It's It's just so tiny. I would... In the future, like I have it in as three millimeters right now, but in the future, I'm going to work towards getting that to like six millimeters because this is the, 
the ball hole and bolt size? Yeah. Is, are those yeah. actually bigger there? Because I see the main thing I see is it looks like there's potential interference through the the rod. It would scrape the rod on that bottom left corner. Oh uh, yeah. Screen. Yeah, you're right. You are right. So we have to address that. Yeah. Yeah, it can be hitting the rod there because the rod is moving, moving past the rod. So, yeah, but this this as is, yeah, I guess you picked that out. Yeah, right here it would be rubbing, but it's just slightly off that because you can move that forward a little bit. That sandwich, you can get that sandwich, move it forward. can all be adjusted. So and th those are just 3D yeah. printed plastic plates, I assume. They're with yes, they are. Several holes, okay. Uh, yeah, you got to print. So, for example, in D3D 1902, you've got um, part library. You've got there's the E3D Titan bracket. So that's the bracket for the Titan. It would fit any other extruder too, though. Uh, but it, you probably need to undersling it. So okay, so that that's actually a big change. Uh, if you're not using the Titan with the long volcano heater block, or if you're just not using the volcano heater block, you're not going to reach below the, the carriage. Therefore, you have to put your extruder underneath. Now, why? what's the difference between the two? The difference is that if you put it below, the, the extruder is going to be farther away from the, car from the axes, so there's a more leverage. Therefore, it will wobble just a little bit more on you because it's not as tightly constrained to the axis. The farther away from the axis, tiny wobbles on the axis and it's be, a, be magnified by a long lever arm. So in this case, why I like the one on top is that the extruder tip is very close to the actual rods. So it's really nice and tight and firm without much cantilevering. Does that make sense? So, which means that uh, we get higher high speed performance, but it's not critical at low speeds. Yeah, so the, and that's why you prop the, the, the bed up higher um, with the, some of those other. Yeah, I had to do it. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. It could be it done on the uh, other versions as well that way, the same plastic parts. Um, so, yeah, I guess the other way to, to, to mount the motor is just saying underneath if you've got a shorter. Block. Well, hmm. I guess there's some things, uh, there's some things not drawn with the extruder there. But yeah, that, that volcano block, yeah, I'm used to seeing it uh, as a longer. But I guess the, the difference between the volcano and maybe the other uh, E3D or whichever uh, blocks or hot ends you're using is that the volcano was hotter. Is that it? Mostly. And the idea there is that because the heater cartridge is vertical, like the path where you're heating is longer. The other way you have it turned 90 degrees and it's going through the thin side. So there's just more distance where you're getting the heat when you're melting the filament. So it can melt more. Okay, it's, it's vertically fine. oriented as opposed to like horizontal orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've looked at some of that E3D yeah. design stuff before. But yeah, because let's see, I recall that the hole, yeah, the hole where the um, next to the nozzle, the vertical hole next to the nozzle is the temperature sensor, I think, right? So there's two holes. One is the thermistor, another one is the heater cartridge itself, oh, which is a resistor. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I've got some holes on it. Yeah, I what the. Uh, yeah, I guess you have to think about the advantages and price differences on those. Um, don't mind. I guess for myself, I wouldn't mind having a, a good printer uh, that would do everything. But, uh, you know, it's good to test the, um, it'd be interesting to test the uh, PVC frame as well. So, and, you know. Uh, did I mention last time, did I mention the scalable heater block? I think, okay, this is new. I didn't even mention this, but when, uh, so, so I just got the super volcano 
which is 150 bucks. That's insane. It's essentially a 25 cent piece of aluminum that they sell for $150. Um, so I was thinking, okay, let's do, uh, how about we do scalable designs of this? Uh, so I posted this on the RepRap forum to, to get feedback. But basically, the idea is why not just stack two of them or three or four or five or how many you like. Practically, you probably can do two or three. Uh, but you're basically using the Volcano blocks and just connecting them together with M6 threaded brass. So you look at that. But basically, there you go. Uh, don't pay 100 50 pay you know 250 pay $2.50 for the volcano which you can get from China and put a few of those together um, so take like in this cat here take two of these or three of these blocks and then you connect them together and then you put individual heater elements into each block how's that so that's to give you a There's longer nothing wrong zone yeah, that's called going from 40, 40 watts to 80 watts okay. uh, at a cost of $5 as opposed to $150 because the only one that's available off the shelf is the 153D, right? Yeah, I so think here I you can do that for $5. Some of the stuff I saw about E3D before, it also sounded like they're also trying to shorten the path uh, because I guess there's issues with that, like, I guess it's mostly shortening the path of the filament before it melts. I guess after it melts, it's less critical. Is okay, that... you're talking about a different concept. Uh, the concept you're talking about is about printing flexible filaments, where you want to oh, reduce yeah. the path length after you're driven, after you do the drive wheel. You've got to reduce the path to the point where it comes out the nozzle. Yeah, so that's the other sure. thing. That's the thing I was... Uh, I think I, I mentioned a little bit about the rubber extruder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other other time. Yes. Um, but I don't wait. I don't think I even. Um, let's see, let's see what do we have for rubber extruder. I didn't talk about that at last meeting, did I? You mentioned it. I mentioned it, but actually, did I show a diagram? Mm, I don't think so. Okay, so I, I started working on a diagram of that because this is, I think we've got to do it. Um, so let's see this rubber extruder, see if I can find it. I want to show that point because that's actually a good development point. Rubber, why am I not finding it? It was under... Flexible, rubber, flexible. I don't know why it's escaping me right now. Um, there's scalable heater block and then Oh, I, I don't know. I might have been just doodling in my notebook. But the idea there was, yeah, maybe I never even put this. I typically work it on like Google Docs. But uh, the idea there is, uh, Abe, to address your comment, and let's maybe look at uh, let's look at the actual CAD to show what we're talking about because that will be better. Okay, so if you see this here. In the in the Titan Arrow, you've got and you know, we should be looking at the real real one. But there's a drive, there's a gear like a larger gear thumb wheel that's attached to this upper right hole, and the drive gear is like the part that actually drives the filament is approximately like right there upper towards the upper right that leaves you all this distance you see where the extra block is it gives you all that distance it still has to travel 
So the redesign of this would be where the driving part is on the lower right to minimize that distance. So get it as close to the, as low and as close heater block as possible. Hide an arrow does the opposite. Instead of the, the, the drive part being low, it's high. And it's because of their design, how they're doing it. So that to accommodate for that, what they do is they have this neck, this confining neck that sticks up to constrain the filament. Now, that is not as good as just, just shortening the path and getting rid of even to need to constrain the filament because it's going right into the heater block. So that's, that's a distinction there. And we need to do that because this exterior is not designed for it. And I have no data on what, what is the actual rubber throughput rate, which I mentioned we're, we're going to need to do 20 pounds a day. If you're going to print tires, you're going to need to do 20 pounds a day, 5, 10, 20 pounds a day. Uh, I don't know if we can, I don't think we can do that with um, this extruder right now. Might get, well, it depends also what kind of rubber, because there's all kinds of rubber. There's very hard rubber and there's very soft rubber. You would not possibly be even able to do very soft rubber. Uh, durometer 60, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, this would just fail, would just kink up and wouldn't get pushed through. So that's that's the rubber stuff now as far as the heater block itself as long as you get it in there and then you want to use once again three millimeters as opposed to 1.75 because 1.75 will kink up on you much more than a three millimeter naturally because it's thinner yeah to get that many pounds through it i assume you need to go to a much larger uh system anyway several well you so the, the right? data from the super volcano shows 20 pounds a day They've got data on it. That's for regular filaments. It's not for rubber. So that's actually a, a somewhat of a blessing. That's great. Like, like there's already a known solution for 20 pounds a day, proven. So wait on that. That's there. And that meets like industrial productivity on a small scale. So that opens up a lot. Thinking about. Uh, even to the point where you can be taking scrap plastic, mixing it 50-50 with like wood residues or like sawdust, can be how about 3D printing um, WikiHouse parts, the parts that they usually get out of plywood, which is 20 bucks a sheet of plywood, 20 or 30 bucks a sheet of plywood. So this could be a way to get the recycling stream and wood waste stream to build construct, real construction materials. So the only update I can say on that is I thought about, okay, let's print some glazing materials, some plastic lumber. Well, how about we print an entire 4 by 8 panels? Like I'm printing right now the, for the tiny model. We just scale it up, print the whole thing in multiple materials. So you've got the structure, you've got the glazing part, you've got rubber gaskets, all in one print. How would that be? That sounds pretty exciting, right? Uh, that's possible with your... Uh, so we have to do some of that. That requires that you have low-cost access to materials processing infrastructure. At that level where you're printing large things, it becomes a material handling issue. Material handling and processing. So it's beyond the thing that you do on your desktop where you just buy yourself a roll of filament. Uh, if you were to do this with off-the-shelf filament, each module would be like $1,000 because... Filament is ten bucks a pound, and the module, like the one we use for the greenhouse, let's say it weighs fifty pounds. Okay, so fifty times a hundred, uh, fifty times ten, that would be five hundred dollars. Yeah, five hundred dollars per module. Now, so if you go to the waste stream, then you can get that at low cost. Um, so there's development needed there. There's a lot of development. So that's why we're working on a larger printer. And all this stuff, this is like the prelude to getting professional grade quality that anybody can build. Scaling this up is the next step. Getting the larger heater blocks, including rubber ability in this system. It's a summary of the, the roadmap on that. But with that, you can get, you're talking about major distribution of productivity that's possible. Now, is it going to happen? It's up to us.
Okay, so that's that, um, Abe. So let's see, Nathan. Um, um, I would say maybe Nathan and, and Abe maybe pivot a little bit to, to the point where you can get your build a printer so you can do the prototyping without have me being the bottleneck. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's that's the uh, that's the idea. I'm I here now to uh, San Francisco, so. Yeah. I'm try, like I'm figuring out work work situations and living situations and everything like that. But I think I should have something, you know, a space where I can set up a three D printer by by next month. Yeah, yeah, it should be good. Now Alex and Sarah are out there and they have printers, so. Oh, cool. Okay, yeah. Right. Maybe I'll just reach out to to Alex. I think he's in Oakland, so let's uh, chat and okay. see if. Uh, since you're connected to the dev team, they, they haven't been on a dev team. They, you know, they kind of started doing their own thing at yeah. this point, but get them engaged back in this, then you can make some progress. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to Alex today. Yeah. Okay. By, um, by Thursday, by yeah. And you, Abe, you as far the, as the, uh, the bottleneck, I guess what you're saying, I know before you're, doing plans, you, you have the website and stuff set up for doing like kits, different versions of kits of printers, but I said that, that you're saying it's a bottleneck for you to do that, because uh, I know that that takes a lot of time, and you're probably the only one building those, right? That, so, are you saying okay. the idea is to just be able to use the bomb to, to order the parts, so that uh, it's not like a kit that's taking up your time to put together? I can help out, but what I would suggest is do some prep work, like understand it thoroughly so that what I would suggest maybe the next steps, uh, can you do like where you take a, do like a visual bomb off of this thing. Mm -hmm. So for every single part, maybe um, do, a, you know, put it into a Google doc and then point to the part and point to a link in the bill material so that it's transparent What if everything is there. And it would be useful if you actually added some more details, like, okay, add the end stops in there, like a few more of the details, like, for example, the build plate, get it to be a complete professional grade design. And professional grade means that it's not missing anything, um, as opposed to like a bunch of little details missing that make it actually not work at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So, for example... And that was my plan was to get it yeah. um, finished, but I'm yeah. trying to change... Uh, certain parts and I think that I mean, yeah there's still a yeah. potential I can change you some stuff like I've got a bunch of stuff here so we can talk about that but like really understand what you need like for example here on the platform you can very well easily do with a little uh, eighth inch steel plate you don't need the heated bed if you're going to print PLA on the blue tape that works really well you know so for basic prototyping like for example I had the the I made 3D printer here that I was working with or testing for its quality. Uh, that just has P that has no PI. It doesn't have a heated bed and it simplifies it quite a bit. Um, so, you know, do that. So draw that plate in and draw how you're going to support it on some of the missing pieces, but you're going to have to go back to the underslung. So that's the change you're going to have to make. Uh, you can, if you want me to ship you uh, one of our old extruders, I can do that. Um, so I mean, I mean, I'll just ship you all the stuff at the the cost of materials, which shouldn't be too much, you know. Um, and it will work, but it's not something you're going to go like professional grade. It's it'll be good experimental and doing basic prototyping. Uh, which is acceptable, but for example, like with a small MKA that's extruder that we used before, you're not really going to be able to do much on rubber or whatever, or you'll ha you'll be able to do things, but just much slower, you know. But it'll, I think, still will be a very useful, useful experience because then you can see some of the limits. You'll see, like, okay, now we can upgrade this. In fact, the other thing I was going to ask. Uh, Remember, I shipped the kit over to um, to Roberto some time ago, and then pretty soon after that, he just disappeared off the team. Should we just ask him to ship it back to you guys, to you, Abe, in particular? 
Uh, maybe I actually thought I saw some activity from Roberto on the wiki a while oh, back, which I was surprised because, okay. um, yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. But right. I think he might have actually posted something on the wiki sometime back. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what he's, yeah. he's doing with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I guess, torn. I, I understand some of the extruder and stuff like that about the the overall build and, and in some ways that like a printer that um, if I'm going to invest in a printer, I wouldn't mind having the good quality parts and stuff that's, you know, uh, what's being worked on, uh, some of the well, think, stuff. I, but, you know, for the frame, I wouldn't mind, you know, testing the frame is a good way to, to learn some of the stuff and start out and you can always change parts later because I, I expect that the main difference is going to be the the speed will have to be slower with the plastic frame, but, um, you know, there's, I, I wouldn't mind having maybe a, a decent, uh, extruder, but either way, what's, what's ever good to test, you know, they, obviously these things last, so they can always be, can always change to different parts. Um, um and it'd be nice to have something, hmm, hopefully that, that, you know, works good, uh, the box, because, because if other people see it and it can, kind of talk about it, then other people would be interested as well. Uh, so, yeah, There's, I'm not sure which parts are, uh, are are the most reasonable. But Okay, well, here's a comment on that approach, and that is um, one way to treat this is that you're going to optimize the hell out of the this inexpensive version to make it literally as good as the steel version. That's a possibility. Because yeah. if, you, if you get into all the tricks of exactly what's required to do that, like for example, you fill the frame with concrete or yeah. I, whatever you do. I even wondered I mean, if you could put steel in the frame, but I think that kind of, I don't think it would work as good and you might as well make the frame out of steel, right? Um, well, I mean, you can cons like if you call it rebar, then there's not yeah, no problem with rebar. Yeah, well, you put cheap, if rebar is cheap, you put small rebar inside the pipe. But um, I don't know. I mean, do you end up having to like, hmm, yeah. Like, how do you fasten the? Rebar I don't know. Together but see, those the are, I don't know. Yeah. So. Well, look. I mean, those are valid R and D questions. Like, like basically, you can say. And I maybe rework the frame, so maybe you even use larger tubes, and you work out the perfect thickness of rebar, because rebar only comes so small, like I think the minimum is a quarter. Yeah. Um, then if you actually make it work really well, that could be an innovation that says, wow, here's how you can actually super reinforce a plastic frame, so you literally have a steel plastic concrete composite. I mean, you can treat it as a research project on many aspects that are really valuable. Because, um, like, the, the experiment could be, okay, making 3 printed, like, for example, think about a CNC machine that's made this way, that you're, you're using plastic, you're putting rebar inside it, and filling it with concrete. Can that truly scale? That would be pretty magical if it did. And I don't see why that wouldn't actually be even very practical because they do make concrete based heavy duty CNC machines. In fact, a lot of them do that. And in fact, the most, most precise ones are made of granite. Like when you talk about air bearing making CNC machines, they're made of granite yeah. for the flatness. I think about different frame stuff and around the tube should be pretty efficient. Um, but we could obviously 3D print any sort of frame that kind of gets over to like different extrusion shapes or something. But I know too, sometimes, well, to look at the, I'm not too familiar with the math, but I know sometimes certain structures like I-beam shapes and structures, which I don't know how you'd interconnect any of that, but sometimes certain structural shapes are, um, they hold loads better uh, for like yeah. the top part or something, but... That, that probably makes the assembly more complex or you'd end up 3D right. printing some strange parts. Yeah. I, I don't know how you would... Yeah, I mean, think about film. what would be exciting for you yeah. to do. 
Yeah, so if, if the um, extruders aren't really a limitation, uh, I guess the, then a simpler extruder uh, would be better because it sounds like, um, well, I, I would think that having the larger nozzle size, I think, would be the better thing as long as the, because that, that, let's just test um, the, the speed of extrusion. It, are the um, other cheaper extruders usually have that nozzle size or is that something that's more uh, commonly used on like the volcano? Or... Not sure if they use the MKA with, with volcano, but you can do, um, I mean, it's, the only thing we have done is the MK8. Let's see, does, can M, Google, can MK8 um, I'm kind of assuming volcano. that the larger three millimeter filament, because that's the biggest, right? It, it may require more heat, right? I mean, to melt it fast enough, right? And extrude faster. So. And part of the, I guess the heat, it is part, part of the speed there. And not like you're saying, you yeah. know, if you could stack multiple heaters, but I wonder, wonder how stacking heaters in series. Um, that's all to be that, determined. That's I mean, a complicated is... thermal thing. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's how fast some of those, it's cool. Yeah. And it, like you said that having it closer than end of the nozzle closer to the axis is obviously a big benefit there. So yeah, I know they're, sounds like they're trying to scale up the heaters to higher wattages too. And I saw some stuff about hotter beds, which I guess if you combine some of those things in an enclosed option, that helps you print a lot of the stuff without yeah. dumping as much heat. Yeah. Maybe. See, um, the extruder is kind of the missing part, which makes, so for a high performance printer, the extruder is definitely like a missing link, I would say, in an open source world, because you got to go to these expensive ones. The M, like the Prusa, uh, I mean, MK8s, I mean, a lot of those people don't care about the fast speed. So that's a, that's a realm that's not really getting pushed far. Because nobody's doing like nobody wants to print furniture. Everyone, you know, is happy with their desktop little printer. So, yeah, that's that's a limit. But that's so. There's Neil in Canada working open sourcing the simple MK8 extruder, which I, I would do that. I would uh, learn how to build that. See, because one way you can think about it is if you develop a good version of this, that's the low brow. I think many other people who want to get into this at a low entry level. So I think that, okay, for on one side, we've got industrial productivity with the main um, D3D 1902 with the E3D expensive extruders, but it's also very useful to have a low cost experimental version like um, that actually works really well. And then, then the excitement there goes about, okay, how well can we make it perform even though it is so inexpensive? And then, then you can make yourself, like once we, so right now we can mill aluminum with a D3D CNC circuit. That's doable. We can be making our own extruders right now. So I would say if you have the energy for that, think about it that way that, okay, I'm going to do a cheapo printer and then I'm going to use further technological recursion to get a, a high performance extruder that is cost you a few dollars because you, now you learn how to make it yourself and, and open source those plans. So we, we gotta be doing the tech recursion where we start building that equipment. Cause like right now, man, yeah, the price on those extruders and a, and a big heater blocks is simply prohibitive. Well, business as usual, it's not prohibitive, but to get the real diffusion and real widespread adoption and certainly limits it. You can't, I mean, with, with $150 for just the heater block, how many people are going to do that right now? You know, not a lot. It just closes that door for a lot of people. Um, yeah, for printing small parts, so, I can see the, the cheaper stuff is good enough. And at low speed, that, yeah. that's fine. And obviously, the plastic frame, even if we get it stiffer, it's just not going to likely scale to two feet or anything like that. Uh, 12 inches is probably um, um, enough. 
Um, yeah, a, but I don't agree with that. Well, what if you do like two inch PVC and rebar in it? Why? Yeah. Why could that not? Yeah. What um, if you do plastic metal composites? Plastic yeah. concrete composites. I I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. You know how they pour the footers for houses in those those uh, cardboard tubes? Yes. Yeah, if a house, if you can put a house on a fiber concrete composite, we can build a 3D printer like that. Yeah, that's true. The material in there could be pretty sturdy. I mean, um, just, that's that to me is the innovation that we got to be doing. Just do ridiculously crazy stuff at a ridiculously low cost. That yeah, I think is I, is exciting. I assume that concrete and steel it has a certain amount of deflection uh, and vibration, even even at lengths. But yeah, I, well, the concrete, the rebar concrete mix is a well proven engineering method that combines the best features of tensile strength and hardness, right? Yeah, yeah it handles uh, compression so, and everything well. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know they do all kinds of, yeah, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff with it, pre-stressed concrete and suspension bridges and so on. I don't know yeah. where to apply that to uh, to this stuff, but, um, yeah, I'd be interested to see how it behaves in, in a piece of pipe. So, yeah. But um, think about it, I mean, think about it this way. You, you're taking, you've got a thin shell that you print out just enough so you can hold the rebar, and, and then pour the concrete in there. So basically, you're basically 3D printing yourself rebar holders in the form of a cubic shape. And then you pour into the, the actual plastic, and you get a super solid, super low cost kind of a frame using this technique. I mean, that is that to me is like, I think that's some significant innovation right there. If you can show that a 3D printer can get you a, this amazingly strong structure uh, as a like 3D printer based, I mean, you're getting the, the complex part is getting the geometry, right? The 3D printer does it. The rest is pouring brute force concrete and re using rebar. Yeah, so that's a, if it's there's a lot of innovation. There. Yeah. Anyway, I, I think that's that's not something to sneeze at. I think that, that would be significant innovation for uh, low cost uh, design of scalable. CNC systems. Yeah, I noticed, uh, Lissy, you were talking about the uh, pretty large scale sheet materials and, and machining, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I noticed something the yeah. other day that there's, for some old stuff they did, um, I think it's more for machining, subtractive stuff, because I don't know how you yeah. do it with 3D printing, but kind of like the hang printer concept, except for with the certain milling machines, instead of having a large gantry system, uh, you make a small portable system that moves across the material, and then you have it figure out its its uh, position in three dimensional space, and things like that, which I guess requires you know marking and, and things like that. But that at some point you kind of need to you might as well scale uh, instead of trying to scale a gantry system. At some point you might as well try something like that. But I don't know how complicated. There's probably no open source software for that. I'm I'm not sure whole different project. I'm sure if you develop it, you can make it work. There's going to be limits and advantages. It's just another thing. Yeah. If you have a system like that, you can tell right now that you're going to be limited to how much force you can enact because you lift yourself and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's a concept. Of, like, for example, the, yeah, the hang printer, with a hang printer, you couldn't do contact machining, for example, right? You can't suspend something like that on a string. So you can do non-contact uh, work like 3D printing with a hang printer. So what is that thing, that, that CNC uh, router that's suspended by chain? Yeah, that's a similar thing. Oh, the one on plywood. Yeah. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, yeah. But you can only do so much so fast before it jumps off the, the plywood. What got me thinking about that again the other day was I saw one of these 3D printing people on YouTube uh, reviewing a, um, I think it was a smart router, but it was kind of a collaborative robot where the human moves the router around, but the computer keeps you from making mistakes. 
it kind of does it for you. So it's got like a yeah, yeah. CNC system on the internally, and it moves the head around. Not, that's a subtractive machine, but I know they've had like hover yeah. hover printers and things like that for years for doing large scale uh, printing giant signs and, and and things like that on the floors of huge warehouses. So I, I the technology actually exists, but um, some of that it, it's for much larger scale. Probably even then we want to go with four by eight sheets. But yeah, yeah, yeah different technologies. Reasons to uh, it'd be nice if there if there's some open source software that would scale that way, but I'm not sure that. Yeah, that's you know those are whole big development projects towards which there's not a lot of open source prior art. Like you know we're working with this 3D printer stuff because all of that is coming out of the RepRap project, right? So you get a lot of that ready to pick from, especially like Marlin that's all there to do all kinds of applications, including Marlin that could be used for CNC milling. Some people that do that too. So yeah. Okay. Um, I gotta get going here because actually the internet guys are here, as I mentioned. But let's see, do we cover everything for today? Anything else? Yeah, yeah. We, we covered a lot, so um, we'll keep in yeah. touch about the, the printer uh, part development here. And yeah, I'll look over the, the bomb for the simple printer and, and figure out. Cause, Obviously, there's a bunch of 3D parts. I guess we would rely on you printing, uh, so that would be the majority of uh, the work on the kit there. Otherwise, we could order just yeah. the, the yeah, I can, parts. I... And, uh, and I guess if you have extra parts, like you were saying on the extruder, that, that could work out if you want to sell those. Yeah, yeah, that's my right. um, So, yeah, yeah, I would take it as. Um, I don't know, like, if you feel that you can do the development, like, the development work that needs to be done is, okay, we need to lower the cost on the extruder part. Like, I don't think it's it's a great deal to be paying so much money when we can spend a little bit of time developing the open source, uh, open source engineering version. It can be made at low cost, so we pave the way for much more activity on this, because... Uh, I think that's what's required to make it gain much more adoption and practicality for more people. So definitely encourage the, the deeper development approach and just getting your hands on a simple, basic version that you can then start optimizing for amazing performance, I'd say. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's keep working on it. Um, that sounds good. So this Friday we'll also go to the 2 p.m., 2 to 4 p.m. Let's continue the next session of the open source golf cart. So I'll send an email out on that. Uh, otherwise, see you on Friday, and then it's going to next Tuesday. All right, yeah. See ya. Okay, see you guys. Thanks a lot. And good work. Hey, by the way, that you picked off the just a comment on on the plastic one with the Titan arrow. That's really good that you were able to pretty much retrofit the. Uh, 1902 design into the PGC frame. That was good. But now I see we have a little bit more work to decide how we do the yeah, probably the under um, the extruder, which is found in other versions. So wait, but that I don't think we we ever cut it up though. Um, yeah, I kind no, of to, the, to just eyeball it. And and there's things like I think to keep the rods the same length, they'd have to flip um, some of those angle brackets around and a whole bunch yeah. of other things that are yeah we've got some work cut out for you on yeah. there just uh, but you can assume that yeah definitely we can start with i mean think about either i mean look at william log right with the the extruder that they're open sourcing because that's actually that's easy enough that you can just get yourself a piece of aluminum and print and maybe i can get you the 3d printed parts but that's that's one that we can build completely open source so we're just getting the stock materials like the aluminum, and then you got to drill it, and then you just got to get a heater block. But with that one, it's possible that you can put the – like once we do it ourselves, we have more flexibility. So you can probably put the volcano nozzle on that one. So that's what I would do. I would, I would work on uh, the Williams version and develop our own that we can then use as the, the experimental one to keep improving to a really high-performance one. 
that just works because we know that we can make it work really well because he's been using that one for years without like any clogging. So we got a good start there. Yeah. So take a look at that again and figure that out. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, guys. So great work. And we'll talk again. Hopefully, see you on Friday for the design sprint. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. yeah. You sure? You can't get internet there. Who me? Yeah. Is that what you were saying? Oh. Yeah. We're talking about fiber line. Talking about getting on a in a fast lane. Okay. So yeah, that's being done. Hopefully for Friday we will have it. So we'll see. Okay. That might All right. Help some things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right, oh yeah. Better. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys.